Good morning, everyone. So, uh, it's Easter Monday. You're all at home having fun. I'm in the office not having so much fun, uh, and I want to go home. So, I'm going to record this video uh, and then tell you a little bit about what's going to come up in the test, uh, give you a few tips, um, and then I'm going to leave. So, uh, just uh, one thing first. Uh, in your module guides, it says in terms one and two, uh, your best five grades out of seven are going to count towards uh, your best five class test grades out of seven are going to count towards your uh, final grades. Um, due to uh, time restrictions, the length of the term, and when the faculty need the marks, uh, we're actually going to uh, reduce the number of total class tests and reduce the number of tests that are going to count. So it's now going to be your best three grades out of the five grades, uh, the five class tests in term one, and uh, similarly for term two, except the first of your term two class test is going to be this Thursday and then there's going to be four more class tests uh, on uh, in term two before we have a revision lecture for the exam. I'll explain to you a little bit more in class uh, but it's worth knowing that uh, the class test on Thursday isn't going to count towards this grade, uh, your term one grade, but it will count towards your uh, semester grade so you still have to come essentially. Uh, okay, so uh, we shall go through very quickly uh, each of the lectures that we've had uh, and I will cover primarily just the material that's going to come up on the, the Thursday um, and, and, and so uh, let you know what things to revise um, for the test. Okay, so in lecture one we talked about uh, what kind of questions philosophers are interested in and the difference between uh, valid and invalid arguments. I'm not going to go into too much detail about the first one. I mean, you know, we've done seven weeks of philosophy now. You should be aware that we're interested in um, the nature of substances and the nature of properties rather than uh, what the charge of an electron is, um, what the mass of uh, a proton is, how exactly how far away the sun is, uh, how fast the speed of light is. We're not interested in those more scientific questions. We're interested in metaphysical questions, epistemological questions, and ethical questions. Go over your notes, uh, remind yourself of what those things are. Invalid and uh, valid arguments. We talked about deductive arguments. We talked about inductive arguments. So deductive arguments uh, uh, are arguments well, a valid deductive argument is an argument according to which the conclusion has to be true if the premises are true. So, uh, if it is true that all bachelors are unmarried men, and it is true that Jim is a bachelor, then it has to be true that Jim is an unmarried man. Great. Um, it can't be false, right? Given those two premises, it just simply cannot be false uh, that the uh, that Jim is, a, is not a, an unmarried man. It has to be the case. It's also sound because premises 1 and 2 are true. So a sound argument is an argument uh, according to which the conclusion can be drawn uh, given those two uh, premises. It's reasonable to uh, draw that conclusion given the premises that you have. So a valid and sound argument, a deductively valid and sound argument, is an argument according to which the premises are both true and the conclusion has to be true uh, because those two premises are true. So that's a valid deductive argument, a sound deductive argument. You can have an argument, a deductive argument that is valid but not sound. So for example, um, I don't know, all rabbits are female, uh, Jessica is a rabbit, therefore uh, Jessica or Jessica Rabbit is, is a rabbit, therefore Jessica Rabbit is female. Okay. Um, well, Jessica Rabbit is indeed female, so the conclusion is true, but um, premise one is false, right? It is not, it is not the case that uh, all rabbits are, are female. Um, and in fact, I don't think it's the case that Jessica Rabbit's a rabbit, come to think of it. Anyway, uh, <laughs> the point is uh, that uh, with a, uh, a valid argument, the conclusion has to be true given the premises. And if the, those premises were true, were, you know, if, if it were the case that uh, all rabbits were female and it were the case that Jessica Rabbit uh, is a rabbit, then it would be the case that uh, it would have to be the case that Jessica Rabbit uh, is female. 
Okay, that would have to be the case. But the, uh, the premise is false. It is not the case that all rabbits are female. And indeed, premise two is false. It is not the case that Jessica Rabbit uh, is a rabbit. If you watch um, whatever that movie is, uh, Roger Rabbit. Um, yeah, something like that. Anyway, so uh, you can have a valid argument that is an argument whereby the conclusion has to be true if the premises are true, that is not sound, and it is not sound in virtue of the fact um, that at least one of the premises uh, is false. Okay. Okay, but inductive arguments are a little bit different. Inductive arguments, um, the conclusion can be false even if the premises are true. Uh, usually these involve moving from the unobserved to the observed. So uh, classic inductive arguments might involve things like, you know, all observed ravens have been black, um, therefore um, all unobserved ravens have been, uh, all unobserved ravens are black, uh, or indeed, you know, all ravens in total are black. Um, and it seems reasonable to infer that all ravens are black given uh, all the observed ravens have been black. We've observed lots of ravens. So it seems reasonable to conclude that. But the thing is about an inductive argument, there's nothing... Um, logically inconsistent by saying, well, uh, one of the ravens in the future might be white. Right? There's, nothing, there's nothing inconsistent about that. It would be inconsistent uh, were we to agree that uh, Jim is a bachelor and were we to agree that all bachelors are unmarried men. It would be inconsistent to then say, well, um, you never know, uh, Jim uh, might not be an unmarried man. Right? That's inconsistent. You can't do that. Jim has to be an unmarried man given those first, first two premises. But uh, with an inductive argument, it is not inconsistent to say one of the future ravens might be white. There's nothing logically inconsistent about that. So that's really the difference between a, a, a deductive and an inductive argument. And of course that makes inductive arguments very, very interesting um, because we can tell the difference between good inductive arguments and bad inductive arguments. So it might be the case that uh, all the uh, chairs in this room are blue. Indeed, it is the case that all the chairs in this room are blue. But I shouldn't draw from that um, all future chairs that are going to be in this room are blue. I mean, you know, it's quite possible that um, chairs next door might, might come into this room. The chairs next door are, are brown, right? I have reason to believe that that regularity, the regularity all the chairs in this room are blue, could fail. Right, so it, wouldn't, it doesn't seem to be a good inductive argument. The move from all chairs in this room uh, are blue to all future chairs in this room uh, will be blue. That doesn't seem to be a good inductive argument. However, it does seem to be reasonable to draw the conclusion the law of gravity will hold tomorrow. That seems to be a reasonable conclusion to make based on the fact that the law of gravity held yesterday and the, and the, the day before that and indeed since the beginning of time um, gravity has held massive objects together. And it seems like we are justified in thinking that gravity will hold tomorrow, and that is a, an inductive inference. That's not a deductive inference. There's nothing uh, logically inconsistent about saying, well, I can imagine it being the case that gravity stops holding tomorrow. When I wake up tomorrow, I'm not going to stick to the floor. I'm going to shoot up into the sky. There's nothing inconsistent, logically inconsistent about believing that. It just seems an uh, absurd thing to believe, uh, given the fact that I've, I've uh, stuck to the floor every morning so far, and indeed the law of gravity is held since the beginning of time. Um, so there are good inductive arguments and there are bad inductive arguments, and uh, the interesting problem is trying to distinguish the difference between those. I mean, we have this intuitive notion uh, which ones are good and which ones are bad, but what is it that makes them good uh, and what is it that makes them bad? Okay. Uh, in the next lecture, we uh, talked about scepticism. Uh, in particular, we discussed uh, Descartes' dreaming argument and then went on to discuss Hilary Putnam's uh, work on brains and bats. Incidentally, sadly, Hilary Putnam passed away last week. Um, I strongly recommend that you find an obituary um, and read through um, uh, Hilary's life. Um, he's a fascinating man. Um, anyway. Uh, we will, uh, I, I will bring up some questions on the dreaming arguments, so uh, go through those slides. Um, I will not uh, test you on uh, Putnam's brains and bats. Um, I think we did enough of that um, last time. 
Um, so I will cover skepticism, but I won't uh, cover Putnam's brains and bats. Um, okay. Now, uh, in the term test, uh, the questions focused on um, God and uh, the lecture on um, the ontological argument and the problem of evil. I will put in a couple of questions uh, on these issues in the um, week seven test that we're about to we're about to have, but uh, I probably won't go into too much detail given the fact that you've all written essays on it. Um, nonetheless, uh, it's worth bearing in mind, um, given um, a few of you didn't quite quite get the point of the problem of evil. The problem of evil was that uh, for those who take God to be uh, omniscient, omnipotent, uh, and benevolent, that is, uh, all-knowing, all-powerful, um, and uh, all-good, it seems weird that God would allow there to be evil in the world. Okay. Um, you know, because if God is all-powerful, then he has the power to stop evil, you know, stop evil from occurring. If he's omniscient, he knows all the evil that occurs. And if he's benevolent, then presumably he wants to stop all evil. So if he is all of those three things, then there shouldn't be any evil. And yet there is. So the problem is explaining why there's evil um, given there is a God that has those qualities. Now, of course, if you don't believe that God has those qualities, then there's no problem. Right, so one solution to the problem of evil is just to deny that God has one or more of those properties. Another is just to deny that there's a God at all. The third option is to try and find a way of uh, making a God with those three, pro three properties compatible with the existence of evil in the world. Uh, now, some of you um, made this nice distinction uh, between uh, moral and non-moral evils, whereby... Uh, you have evils that are uh, a result of human behavior, um, such as, um, you know, nasty people going around stabbing other people, uh, stealing things, and so on and so forth. And you can say that God gave us free will, uh, and you cannot give free will um, and simultaneously prevent evil from happening because, uh, you know, prevent people from committing evil acts. Because that would be to take away free will. Those uh, two concepts are, are incompatible. And, um, you know, it, God, being all-knowing, knows that uh, it is better uh, to have free will than to prevent the evil. So uh, God allows the evil to occur in order for us to have free will. So you can sort of get away with that. But a lot of people question um, uh, natural disasters, right? So... Although the, uh, the free will response seems to deal with uh, explaining evils caused by people, by people's decisions, uh, it doesn't seem to explain evils such as natural disasters in which millions of people get killed uh, not via uh, the actions of other people, but uh, by hurricanes, or tidal waves, and so on and so forth. Um, now, some people respond to that by saying, well, we deserved it. Uh, some people uh, respond in other ways. Um, but what I'd like you to do is just have a few responses uh, up your sleeves so that uh, when you get asked, uh, name three solutions to the problem of evil or, or you know, questions to that effect, uh, you're able to do so without too much difficulty. Um, we look through uh, yeah, the ontological argument for the existence of God's I probably won't test uh, on that because everyone seemed to do a very good job of uh, answering that in their essays. Um, so I'm going to focus more on um, the, the material that we did in week four uh, and uh, a few bits that, that weren't really tested in depth in, in um, class S4. Okay, so in week four, we talked about uh, inductive inferences, the standard problem of induction. We talked about David Hume, the copy principle and uh, necessary connection and how it breaks causation. And then we talked about GRU and the new riddle of induction. I'm not going to test you on GRU because uh, we tested you a bit on that last week. Not um, going to do anything more uh, on inductive inferences over and above uh, what I talked about earlier on in this video. Um, but you should learn some um, stuff about 
uh, Hume, Necessary Connection, and the Copy Principle. So go through those slides and pay particular attention to uh, how uh, Hume believes ideas, um, the kind of uh, sort of perception you have, the, the you know, when you close your eyes and think of redness, that's an idea of redness. When you observe redness directly, that's an impression of redness. And you need to know how uh, Hume believes that you cannot have that idea of redness unless you've had that impression of redness. Uh, and so on for all ideas that we have. And you need to know how this relates to the idea of necessary connection. Uh, how Hume believes that we cannot have an idea of necessary connection between the objects because we have no perception we have no impression, rather, of necessary connection between the objects. Because when we observe causal connections, all you see is one event followed by another. That's all you see. When you see uh, one billiard ball hit another uh, and the other billiard ball move, yes, you're observing an instance of causation, but all you're observing is one event, the first ball hitting the other, uh, and then another event, the, the second ball uh, moving onwards. You don't observe any kind of spooky connection uh, from which you can form an idea of necessary connection between the objects. All you get is this sensation of inevitability. You get a sensation of that second ball had to move given the first one. It's a, it's a sensation of inevitability. It's going to happen. There's no other option. right? And your, your idea of necessary connection is actually something in the mind, not in the objects. It's a copy of something in the mind, not in the objects. Um, Right, so you need, to know, uh, you need to know about that. You're also going to need to know about uh, uh, exceptions to the copy principle, about the missing shade of blue, and about potential responses to the missing shade of blue. Okay, so uh, go through your slides and um, study the missing shade of blue, necessary connection, the copy principle. And finally, you're going to be tested on Gettier and uh, the tripartite account of knowledge, um, also known as um, JTB, Justified True Belief account, and you're going to be tested on Gettier cases. Um, you're going to be asked to uh, come up with a Gettier case that is a case of a justified true belief that isn't knowledge. So do some research if you can, look some up. Um, and uh, I'm going to ask you about some um, alternative conceptions of, no of knowledge. So um, go through the causal account of knowledge, I go through the No False Lemmas account uh, and uh, see whether you think that any of these views work. Okay, so I need you to look at uh, what the Platonic conception is. So the Platonic conception is uh, the justified true belief, is the tripartite account, they're all the same thing. I need to make sure you know precisely what that is. I need you to know uh, why that doesn't work and understand the Gettier cases. And I need you to uh, look through um, the, the alternatives that I, that I put through on the slides and make sure you understand those as well. Um, so I'm going to ask you about uh, whether those work and if so, why, and if not, why not. Okay, so uh, that's it for this video. Um, uh, just to recap, um, the test on Thursday isn't going to count towards your term one grade, uh, but it will count towards your term two grade, so you have to come. Uh, instead, what we're going to have for term one is your best three out of five uh, class tests and your term test, your midterm test, the essay you wrote. Um, we're going to get tested on all of the bits that I've just talked about in the video, so uh, look through it again if you can't remember. Take notes. Notes are not going to be allowed in this test, so you're going to have to remember it. So in other tests, you've been able to take in your notes. In this one, you're not going to be able to. I want to know that you've remembered some of this material. <laughs> well, hopefully all of this material, but we'll see. Um, and uh, yeah, I look forward to seeing you um, on Thursday morning. Enjoy the rest of your holidays. Right, okay, I said right at the beginning of this video that it's Easter Monday. It is, of course, not Easter Monday. Uh, it's Human Rights Day, so happy Human Rights Day, everyone. And uh, apologies for the earlier mistake. Enjoy your Easter Monday next Monday.